So thank you for coming. I'm Sean, and I'm here today to give you an overview of the Security Shepherd project. Uh, Security Shepherd is what got me interested in security. Um, basically, I became a contributor back in college when my friend uh, Mark, he showed up one day and um, he had this um, web-based CTF set up that he introduced to the class. We all play it. And after that, I decided, okay, I want to contribute to this project. Um, so that's how I got into it. At the time, there was a sort of a gap in mobile content. So that's primarily what I've been focusing on. It was good in a way because uh, it got me not only contributing to an open source project, but it got me interested in mobile AppSec as well. And it, it enabled me to sort of dive deep into that. And the project itself is a gamified capture the flag framework. It's got built-in web and mobile challenges. It's got class management system. And my favorite part, of course, is a scoreboard. Um, so the main uh, contributors in it are Mark, he initially uh, started it. And he's, uh, he's essentially the founder of the project. Uh, his work includes the creation of the framework and most of the web-based content. There's also Paul. Uh, he's contributed lessons, lessons and challenges, as well as done uh, translations on getting the project translated to Irish. Uh, he's also ensured that the project could be set up with Docker. So it's pretty easy to set up at the moment. We have uh, two ways to do it. I'm going to go over one. Uh, the Docker uh, method of setting it up is fairly straightforward, so I won't be presenting that. Uh, and then there's me. I've contributed um, mobile challenges and lessons and some other stuff too so uh yeah that's uh here we are at the moment so we um we're all based in ireland um the three of us are working for like uh different companies we're all based in security as well surprise surprise um i'm currently working for lexus nexus and the red team so essentially uh my background is that i have to try and play the role of an attacker and see how far an attacker can get if they find a vulnerability and of course report on it that's the important part and um, the project itself is built on multiple uh, technologies so we use mysql as a back-end database uh, it's a tomcat web application and um, it's built on a uh, jsp and it's running obviously like javascript and html it's web-based so the reason why you see on the left hand side there in the language breakdown is so much java is because it's a JSP application and it's also built on Android Java as well. So if you go onto like our GitHub page, you'll just see Java everywhere. Um, and recently, of course, uh, Paul updated it so that it's, uh, it can be set up with Docker. Um, so normally the three paths of, well, the two main ways of uh, running this is either it, when you're setting it up, you can set it up as uh, it, it comes like installed in the virtual machine a minimalized uh, Ubuntu virtual machine that you can just load into VirtualBox and it will uh, come out with an IP address. That's how you connect to it. Or you can do it through Docker. Or if you're more technical, you can deploy the wire yourself on your own web server. Um, I mentioned previously that there's three people contributing to this, but that was a white lie. Um, this is, uh, we have around 42 contributors um, and they've been contributing things mostly to do it, enhancements, uh, bugs, bug fixes rather, and uh, language updates as well. To give you an overview of what the actual project looks like, once you log in, um, you're presented with something similar to this. So the tool itself has a default look to it, but if you want to fork it on GitHub, you can change the look any way you want. You can add your own challenges as well. But it comes built with these uh, preloaded challenges. So this here is a lesson. Everything is broken down into either a lesson or a challenge. A lesson will tell you how to complete the lesson, essentially, and get the key, whereas the challenge will give you less information, and it will be subjectively harder than a lesson would be. So the lessons just tend to come first, and then the challenges come afterwards in most cases. Um, you can see here that there's a submit result key form. And once you complete a lesson or challenge, the result is always a key. And you'll submit that key to increment your score. 
So in this example, SQL injection, this wall of text at first, people might skip over it, but it's fairly important because it tells you how to complete this lesson. The next one, SQL injection part two, doesn't tell you any of this. And it's implemented some filtering as well. So you have to build on your knowledge of the lessons that you complete to complete the challenges that come afterwards. Um, I mentioned languages earlier. The tool itself, uh, it's, it's got like uh, English, uh, Spanish, Portuguese, Irish, Chinese, and a variant of uh, Hindi. And basically there was a push to get it translated so we could access, so we could provide um, the ability for people from all across the world to play it. If you see a language that's missing, or if you feel that your native language should be a part of this project, uh, either reach out to me and we could work together to get that done, or you could fork the project on GitHub, uh, follow the wiki that we have on GitHub, which tells you how to implement a new language, and then uh, make a pull request. You benefit because you get to, um, you get experience from uh, contributing to an open source project, and that's always a good thing to brag about. And obviously we benefit because uh, now Security Shepherd is more accessible to people who either don't speak English natively or have another language under, under their belt. Um, what's unusual to me is that um, we have it partially translated to Irish, which is not very common in the security industry. So uh, I'd like to see that as well, because obviously it's close to home. When you're, when you're uh, signing into this, there's two types of users. There's an admin user and there is a player, essentially. The player is somebody who's playing the game. They're trying to beat the challenges and lessons. And then the admin user is the person who's managing that. So as an admin user, you can set up a classroom and you can have a scoreboard assigned to that specific classroom. And then you can set up a classroom after that and have another scoreboard. And if you really want to like make things fun, you can compare scoreboards. You can get people engaged by, you know, employing this sort of uh, competition between classes. The um, platform itself has a couple of modes. So by default, in order for you to progress in Security Shepherd, you need to perform lessons and challenges in a linear order. But what you can do is you can uh, enable different modes. So with a CTF mode, um, you have to complete lessons in that linear order. But if you're getting stuck, you can uh, get hints. And um, if you're an admin, you can enable a cheat sheet so that even if you're not like familiar with every single lesson and challenge, what you can do is have a cheat sheet available just for you. And if somebody's stuck, you can help them out. Um, the whole, I find like the best environment for Security Shepherd personally um, is when it's a classroom environment. So you're in a room with probably like 30 people. Everybody's signed in, they all have a set up and they all can access the application and they go through the challenges. And it's even better if you have a big screen somewhere or a projector showing the scoreboard. So once people see that, they get way more engaged than they would be previously if they just had challenges to go through in a linear fashion, because they suddenly want to um, be better than the person next to them. They want to be the best hacker in the room. Um, some of the other features that has is you can um, enable or disable certain challenges, like maybe if you just want to focus on SQL injection, you can configure it so that only that's available. Or if you want just mobile lessons, you can do the same. This is my favorite part of the application. It's the scoreboard. Um, so scoreboards are generally, um, it, it shows the points and the username that you pick as a player. And you can see in the drop down there that you can uh, change classes to show different scoreboards. Now, Another addition that isn't shown in this uh, picture, we have medals now. So if you complete a challenge first, you get a gold medal. Second, you get silver, et cetera. And that adds just a bit more depth to the score as well. And uh, yeah, so far, like I found, it's just what people seem to enjoy the most is that competitiveness. Um, as I mentioned previously, I do all of the mobile application development. Now, recently, I've made the decision to uh, completely remove it and replace it with a completely new app. So previously when I started, I decided, okay, I'd make a few mobile challenges, but maybe like maybe like five, 10 max, but 
I kind of got immersed in it and I found myself making more and more and more. And it got to the point where I realized this isn't scalable at all. So I have all of these individual apps and they're fairly small, but they have like whatever vulnerability is relevant to the challenge. So if you want to perform like mobile injection, you have to start the mobile injection app um, to get around having people installing all of these. I created, not I created, but I um, set up a uh, virtual machine that's running an old version of Android and it has these apps installed on it, pre-installed. But that's fine, but it's still difficult for me at the moment because maintaining all of those individual apps, it, it as I said, it's not scalable. So what's best to do from this point going forward is to make one app. Um, it seems obvious, but yeah, make one app and have all of the uh, lessons and challenges for that uh, for the mobile content on that one app. So I think that will be a lot more fun as well because it'll mean that I'll get to make an app that's just full of vulnerabilities. And I know like as I'll be developing, like uh, Android Studio will probably be shouting at me like, well, I don't publish this, uh, whatever, but it'll be some good fun. Um, and I'll get to, um, when I do like uh, start over, I'm going to, use this to become more familiar with like the more up-to-date Android SDK and what new features are available and what new ways I can make a broken vulnerable application. Um, and that can be used to cater new lessons and challenges as well. Um, if anybody has any mobile app dev experience, I'd welcome any advice whatsoever. Uh, we can either talk over Slack or my emails at the beginning of this presentation. I can share it over the Slack chat as well. And uh, of course, there's the GitHub page as well. So uh, I can continue talking, but I think the best thing to do here is to also show you a video of like the setup of Security Shepherd and the lesson and challenge uh, demonstration. So I'll get this up now. Right, so the very first step you would do, like, let's uh, think about it this way. Uh, you've just uh, you've just decided that you want to learn more about web application vulnerabilities, and you hear about tools out there that OS provides, like um, different CTF tools, and you decide to give Security Shepherd a try. So in that case, the very first thing you do is you have to get set up with a um, web application proxy. Um, SAP is a fine example of one of those. So in this example, I set that up. I'm not going to go over the full setup. Um, all of these solutions have readmes and such. The next thing you do is you want to get VirtualBox. So in this case, I'm running it on the Windows machine. And then you want to get Security Shepherd to Virtual Machine version 3.1. Once you do that, you're going to import Security Shepherd into VirtualBox after you download it and extract it. And in this situation, we already have this app set up. So with, um, with the download from Security Shepherd, there's a readme. The uh, virtual machine that you download running Ubuntu has uh, credentials there in the README, and that's for the initial setup. When you initially log in, you're going to get an IP address here. So if you follow this HTTPS and the IP address, you will get to the web application because it's now running on your machine or it's running on the virtual machine hosted on, hosted on your machine. The default um, credentials to log in the very first time are admin password. Um, once you log in, you'll be prompted to change these.
Okay, so once logged in, the very first thing you do is you uh, sign in as an administrator. And in this case, uh, you can configure the application whichever way you want. So for this example, I'm going to open all the web app levels. And if we go through some of the features here, like I've mentioned previously, we have the cheat sheet, sheet management. Uh, we have feedback. So if you want uh, your classroom to give feedback on how difficult something was or what they learned during um, lessons and challenges, you can enable the feedback feature so that every time they go to submit a key before they complete the lesson, they have to like, up, well, they don't have to, but they can submit some feedback like in a form, for example. And that feedback is saved. You can open and close registration as well. So if you're hosting it online, you can um, have different uh, like time zones available. And of course, you can turn off the scoreboard if you wish and set up a custom uh, database server. The um, different uh, layouts, you can enable a tournament mode and open floor mode. Um, it's basically up to you. And you can also block uh, certain modules. So if you don't want the lesson to be uh, available, you can turn it off. Uh, there's the few feedback feature because I'm signing as an admin. And then there's uh, player management. So you can add and remove players, uh, add uh, points or remove them. Like maybe if you're hosting a class and somebody finds an interesting way to you know, be the challenge that either you haven't heard of before or that isn't in the cheat sheet, then you can maybe give them additional points. Or if somebody's like, maybe they're scanning the application. Generally, uh, with Security Shepherd, it's a bad idea to do that because this automated scanners can uh, trigger the um, score functionality. So if you're trying to submit a key and the scanner is submitting wrong keys over and over and over, um, your score is going to go down because you're just trying wrong keys repeatedly. So this is all about manual pen testing. Don't use a scanner at all. So in this example, I'm going to enable open floor mode so I can go through any lessons and challenges I want to. Maybe like in this case, I'm an individual user. I can sign in as a, an admin and I can, if I, if I decide, you know what, I want to brush up on my cross-site request forgery skills, I can do so by just um, enabling open floor mode and then testing those out too. So as an example, I'll show you um, how a lesson works. As you can see, there's the wall of text and you can hide the lesson or introduction. And then right here in this iframe here is the basically the guts of the lesson. So what you want to do is you want to tamper with information going from your machine to the host. And you want to do so in a way that the host trusts the input coming from the machine because it's, it's essentially been programmed to think that you can't modify the information here, or you can't modify information unless there's a form. And uh, we're going to get around that by using Zap. You set it up like so. So one of the features I like about Zap is that you get when you're sending uh, when you're intercepting server requests and responses, there's a lot of things like uh, headers and such, but it'll separate parameters as well. So and highlight them so it makes it much more readable. And um, I find this is good for like classrooms as well because when it comes to teaching people um, pen testing, at the very like first thing you want to do is you don't want to overwhelm them. And uh, when it comes to like uh, cookies, which are important to look at, right? And uh, CSRF tokens and headers. If you're just demonstrating 
insecure direct object references, it's good that this is just highlighted. So we can see that there's a guest username. We can change that to, let's say, admin, see what we get. And this is the first lesson. You get your key and you submit it and your score should increase. But in this case, it doesn't. So the reason why is because we're signing in as an admin and admins optionally have access to uh, the scoreboard or rather have access, have the ability to update the scoreboard by submit keys. You can turn that on if you want, but generally um, it's off by default. So in this case, I'll go over registering a user. The email address is an optional field. So you just need to put in the username and password. So I went over that again, but I skipped doing the same lesson again because I didn't want to repeat myself. So now we can see that I was in the scoreboard. Um, all of the lessons and challenges in this, they, they have real vulnerabilities. And um, essentially, although the vulnerabilities are real and you're exploiting them, they're not made in a way that they can exploit the over, overall framework. So. It's, it's a good mix of, you know, showing people actual hacking techniques and the results of them. And in some cases during classrooms, people can get like uh, interesting results from this. So there's a user search here that's vulnerable to SQL injection. And this is a, another lesson. And we can see like, uh, there's a lot of help going on here. So first of all, when we search for user, which you could like determine is like usually default username, like it's always user or admin or root or something similar, you're getting back um, a result. But if you throw in a semicolon or a single quote, you can see that you're getting back a da database error, which in my experience is 99.999% of the time is an indication of SQL injection. Also, if you try like um, this search multiple times, and if you try other things as well, like in other lessons, this um, box will appear, which will offer you a hint. Now, I know in this case, it'll show you the entire query that you're writing and the input you're putting into it. And from that, it lets people more easily visualize the SQL injection attack you're doing, because I mean, in the wild, you don't always get that. Um, so it's nice to have it if you're learning. We can see here that one of the um, one of the rows in the database had the key. And that's the scoreboard. So challenges are a little bit more difficult. And I say that in that the challenges that come directly after lessons are a little bit more difficult. They get tougher and tougher as you do more and more of them. Um, to the point where from experience, uh, I've seen uh, like uh, high school students will usually get between the first 15 and 20 uh, levels complete. And um, maybe security professionals will get like 30 or so. It's all dependent on time because even if you are competent and you know it, like how to like complete lessons. If you're hosting a class in a three hour slot, there's only a limited amount of things that people can do. So what I tend to do with this particular project is I'll make it available to people, but then I'll host it elsewhere. So if they want to continue playing, which in most cases, a lot of them do, and um, they still have that option, or I tell them how to set it up themselves. And then they don't have to like spend an entire day, like maybe 12 hours or so, constantly like playing non-stop they can come back to it when they have free time and they can just learn on the fly this challenge here is based on no sql injection and i believe it was submitted by paul so we can see we're getting a gamer id there's a mongo uh, db in use on the back end as well and the typical SQL injection isn't going to work here. We have to change the syntax up a bit. Um, 
generally uh, with this challenge if you're if you're playing and you find yourself stuck it's never cheating to google things right so if you find that you're stuck you can see it's no sql googling something like um, no sql injection chi chi and uh, no sql injection attacks etc eventually will lead you to the conclusion that you can perform such an attack here like this So in that case, I used it to select all of the rows and get the key. Cool. Right, so um, that's the overview of how the application works. So going forward, there is still a lot of work to do. Um, we have open issues on GitHub. Um, we want to perform some UI improvements as well. I mean, judge for yourself, like the application looks fresh. It's easy to use. Um, it doesn't, there's not a lot going on on the screen either. However, we would like uh, to get some, uh, maybe somebody who has like experience with UI development because we don't. Um, but I still think we've done a fairly good job. Um, more translations, of course. Like I mentioned at the start, always up for new challenges, especially like uh, new challenges based on new vulnerabilities would be a lot of fun, I think. Um, bug fixes is an ongoing thing for any project, really. Mobile app dev, I'm uh, spearheading that one. So uh, I'll be the one to contact in that case. And of course, uh, yeah, uh, after, after we have all of that done, we want to push out a new release as well. There's the um, GitHub link there. If you want to find it online, just Google GitHub Security Shepherd and it will show up. And uh, that's me. And um, thank you for listening. <laughs>